hallelujah hallelujah we bless your name god glory to your name hallelujah to the alpha and to the omega beginning and end hallelujah to the one who said to moses i am the i am that i am hallelujah to our husband man this morning hallelujah to our redeemer this morning hallelujah glory to god whether you're in jamaica or somewhere else i know it's morning for you right now in the uk but even now whatever hour of day it is whether it's night or evening we give god a hallelujah can we just raise a hallelujah even now just raise a hallelujah in the presence of the almighty god right now even as we say we welcome you holy spirit fill us with your presence fill us with your glory oh glory to god can somebody say holy spirit we welcome you can somebody say ruach we welcome you oh hallelujah the numa of the lord the numa of the godhead we say welcome welcome into our midst welcome into our homes welcome into our atmosphere spirit of the living God can the church just begin to open up their mouths and begin to praise God extol him or oh, honor him and magnify him let us do what David has called us to do David says come magnify the Lord with me let us exalt his name together can we just do that together today oh glory to God hallelujah and even as you join, I invite every single person to go right ahead and hit that share button so that other persons can benefit tremendously from tonight's broadcast. We love the Lord. We love him with all of our hearts. We love him with all of our might. We love him with all of our strength. He is, he is our everything. In him, we find joy. In him, we find peace. In him, we find an identity. We love you, God, because there is no one like you. Absolutely no one. We have searched all over but we couldn't find anybody like you oh you have no match you have no rival and so we lift you up oh God we want you to feel as special as you ought to feel we want you to feel oh as set apart as you are almighty God we are her hearing rather of many gods that are pretty much the work of men's hands but we know you are the most high God oh father we lift you up because you have nobody in your category nobody else Elohim El Elyon we bless your name we glorify you this evening we honor you we extol you great deliverer our savior our healer our counselor our teacher, the ultimate rabbi, our master and friend, we lift you up. We celebrate you. We honor you. We give you the highest praise. Can the church just begin to give God the highest praise? Can you just open up your mouths? We don't have a drum where we are. We might not have the keyboard, the piano. We don't have the instruments. We don't have the timbrels. We don't have the cymbals. But what we do have are our tongues and our lips. And with those, we're going to lift up God. Hallelujah. Oh, glory to your name. And so, Father, even as we gather right now to deliver a potent word a word that you have inspired we pray that the hearts of the recipients will be prepared we pray father that minds will be prepared we pray that every fallow ground will become broken up right now in the spirit realm we pray that every heart that is like a fallow ground will receive water. Can somebody say rain down God on every fallow ground in the name of Jesus Christ, son of the living God. Break up fallow grounds right now. Your word says so in righteousness, reap in mercy. Break up your fallow ground for it is time to seek 
the Lord. So, Father, we ask that every fallow ground will be confronted by your spirit, will be confronted by your power, will be confronted by your might. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, we say move into households right now. We say move upon husbands, move upon wives, move upon children, move in our midst, Father. Can somebody say move, Lord, move? Kata, rebe koshianda rabasata. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We bless your name, God. We honor you, Father. I want to say welcome to every person that has already joined the broadcast. Bonnie, I see you. Welcome. Annette, welcome. Tilsa, Tilsa Gittens, welcome. June, thank you so much for joining. Jacera, welcome. Donna, welcome. Dolores, it's so good to see you. Thank you also to those persons who have already extended an invitation to others who are on your Facebook pages. Some of you are a part of groups. Some of those groups are on Facebook. Others have groups in WhatsApp. Please just take the next few seconds to hit that share button even as we encourage as many of the Lord's laborers to hear the word that he has to strengthen them tonight. Is there anybody who wants to be strengthened tonight? Well, let me tell you something. I know there are tons of other persons who would love to receive strength from the word of God tonight. Hence the reason you're being invited to go right ahead and extend an invitation to your friends, your loved ones, and persons you know, and especially those who are in ministry, persons who are working in the vineyard, even as Ruth found herself in the vineyard. Oh, glory to God. We expect that the Lord is going to rain down and he's going to show up. He's going to manifest in fire today. We anticipate that the presence of the Lord will be transferred. It will be felt. We anticipate that deliverance will occur. I'm hearing in the realm of the spirit that there are some persons who will receive not just spiritual deliverance because the enemy has placed you and your ministry in some kind of bondage. But I'm hearing that there are some persons who will receive emotional, oh glory to God. The Lord says, I want to, oh glory to God, liberate the emotions of my people because the enemy has placed much of your emotions your souls into bondage so God says tonight the word is expected to release you the chains ought to drop they will drop the shackles must drop in the name of Jesus can somebody say freedom we welcome you in our midst can somebody say restoration we welcome you in our midst can somebody say revival we we welcome you in our midst. Move, spirit, move. Move, Ruach. Move, Numa. Move in our midst. In the name of Jesus Christ, Son of the living God. Be still and know that I am in your midst. I am here to comfort. Rakon to rimi sakanda raba shanda raba hatata. Leba kushundu ribia santa. And as you set your heart, makutu brihianda raba ha. And your eyes upon me, labo shekende raba sutu rumushki raba ha. I shall rama seki brahim de rebo shaha. Accompany my word, makente de lebo shandai. With signs, mandai, wonders, rako torebe eshkebahandai, manifestation. Laba kotoribianda, I'm in your midst. Kalaba shanda raba sata, randero shuturubu sandai, leba kutube hendio shanda raba satai. I am the Lord, makantai, I changeth not. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Jesus. So, we are in the book of 1 Kings, chapter 19, to be exact. Now, for those persons who joined the broadcast on Thursday, we delved into a very sensitive 
aspect and time in the life and ministry of a very powerful man of God called Elijah who remembers what we talked about we looked at the fact that although God used this very powerful individual and one who in the eyes of men was seemingly very confident confident to the extent where he obliged or accepted a showdown oh glory to God on Mount Carmel we know that in that showdown some 850 prophets were invited to be a part we know that in that showdown 450 of the worshipers of Baal were destroyed by fire from heaven. Can somebody say fire from heaven destroyed the prophets of Baal? So one could see confidence being exemplified through the acts of God, through his servant Elijah, even on the Mount of Carmel. Then we also learn afterwards that there was a famine in the land. In fact, the man of God is the one who we can say initiated the famine or the spirit of the Lord in the man of God initiated a famine in the land of Israel. The famine was very bad. It lasted over a period of three and a half years. At the end of three and a half years, which was not long after the Carmel experience, the word of God says that the man of God went into seven dimensions of intercession. He had his son servant Elisha with him and on several occasions he would ask Elisha look and tell me what you're seeing in the sky and he did it until Elisha said I see what looks like a fist of cloud hanging over the sea and then the next thing we know is we hear the Lord's servant Elijah saying oh go down because I hear the sound of an abundance of rain so we know God used this man very mightily very powerfully and we know that word was spread in the, in the land of Israel because according to the word of God, when Ahab went home to his wife Jezebel, the word of God said he told Jezebel all that Elijah had done. So we know that if the king heard it and the king's wife heard it and the servants in the palace heard it, we know that persons throughout the land of Israel heard it. So all heard of the power of God, even as he worked through this one called Elijah so we're still recapping we also went into explaining and assessing that it is so possible for God to use one very mightily to perform wonders to deliver he can use one to do many signs and one can be glorified by men just because of the powerful way in which oh, the Lord uses such individuals. But despite looking so strong and confident in the natural realm, one has to understand that be, be, before Elijah became a prophet or before glory to God he began to manifest as a prophet he was a human being first and there are some times when we're doing the will of God there are some times when we're carrying out the Lord's instruction when the, the flesh of oh glory to God the element of the flesh becomes manifested because we are indeed flesh we were made from dust and to dust indeed we shall return we looked at dust and its meaning on Tuesday and we spoke about the fact that it speaks to the nature of man man is very fickle man is nothing can somebody say man is nothing so much so God says when I look at what you call your righteousness what I see are filthy rags before me because your righteousness is nothing but filthiness before me so even though we try glory to God it's as though we will never hit that mark of 100% perfection because we are man so one can only understand the reason why the flesh element manifested itself in the life and ministry of this one called Elijah so we are recapping oh glory to God we looked at 
how this man of God, Elijah, found himself in a state of isolation. Who remembers when the word of God said that he, he took his servant with him and he went to a place called Beersheba. That was already separation, separating from where they were before. They were at Gilead. He has moved from Gilead or Gibeon. Let's double check. Glory to God. And now he's at Beersheba. The word of God said that when he got to Beersheba, another level of separation took place. Elijah separated from his servant. This servant who was always with him, keeping company, was there to do the little things that he would have wanted assistance with. He was there by his side. But this man of God was in such a state of what was seemingly depression and distress because of the death threat that was launched against him by one called Jezebel. The word of God said not only did Jezebel threaten to take the life of the man of God, but Jezebel put an expiration date on the life of the man of God. She said, by tomorrow, I must do unto you, even as you have done to the prophets of Baal. And we talked about the fact that similar to Elijah, so are many of us operating in ministry. People are hearing of God's work in our lives. People are hearing of how God is using us to deliver and heal his people. And instead of them rejoicing with us or rejoicing with God or rejoicing over all the good things that God is doing, they have a tendency to judge. They have a tendency to be jealous. They have a tendency to be envious. And instead of them speaking life over our ministry and speaking life over us, they start to speak words of death, even as Jezebel did in the case of Elijah. And not only are they speaking words of death, even as they're in their secret places, even as they meet with their secret societies, even as they're in their bed chambers, they're putting an expiration date on the ministries of the people of God. So there are some people saying that, oh, I want that ministry to end. I don't see it going over a year. I see it dying after four years. Oh, let's talk about the marriage. I don't see that marriage going beyond three years. I don't see that marriage going beyond five years. So there are some people who are hearing of your prosperity and how much God is using you and blessing you. And instead of them celebrating with you, they have gone ahead, driven by the spirit of jealousy and envy, even the spirit of murder, to go right ahead to devise some things that will lead to your death. For some of us, it's not a physical death that they are intending to see, but what they want is for us to die spiritually. Maybe you're too zealous for God. Maybe you look like you're too much on fire for God. So they're about to set some traps that will cause cause you to be silent, that will cause you to fall down, that will cause you to seem as though you are not the person you appear to be. Can somebody say, I understand. So we looked at the man of God first separating from his servant, his servant in Beersheba. And we saw where the word of God said he went into the wilderness. We discussed that the wilderness is a inhospitable place. The wilderness is an unfavorable place for human beings. It is an unfavorable place for human survival. In the natural realm, that is the definition and I hope one is already beginning to imagine what that would look like. But in the realm of the spirit, when one goes into a state of isolation, it is a state where you don't want to associate with some people who are indeed key to your life and ministry. But the enemy has you in such a low and dark place that you just want to separate and isolate. When you're in isolation, you no longer even believe the words that they speak to you. You no longer trust. It's like you no longer hope. It's like you no longer persevere because you feel as though there is no one who really understands you and understands. Stand the weight of the cold.
calling on your life. So Elijah was isolated. It was a physical isolation. But we know that God has a tendency of using physical examples to establish spiritual principles. Glory to God. So here we are now, we're going to continue under a different theme, but the same scripture, 1 Kings chapter 19. We're going to read from verse 9 to 18. I want you to get your Bibles. I just want to use this opportunity real quickly to say hello to uh, Desreen, <clears throat> Loris, I see you as well. For those persons who have not yet hit that sheer button, please feel free to go ahead and do that. And if you're joining for the very first time, I'd like you to type first time on the screen and you can write it in caps. We welcome every first timer. And if you're watching for the first time, we also would love for you to share the country from where you're watching the program. So we want to extend a special welcome to you. Levi, good to see you. Thank you so much. And thank you, Donna, for putting the scripture on the screen. First Kings chapter 19. We're going to be reading from verse 9 to 18. So the word of the Lord, according to this passage, reads thus. And Elijah came thither unto a cave and lodged there. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. Can somebody say the word of the Lord came to Elijah? And he, this is the Lord now, said unto Elijah, What are you doing here, Elijah? And he said, I have been very zealous can somebody write the word zealous on the screen? I have been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts. For the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. And I, even I, only am left, and they seek my life to take it away. Verse 11. And he said, go forth and stand upon the mount before the Lord. Can somebody say, go forth? And behold, the Lord passed by, and a great strong wind rent the mountains. Can somebody say, a strong wind rent the mountains, and broke in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not, can someone say, the Lord was not in the wind. Oh, glory to God. I want you to tell two persons who are watching the broadcast that the Lord was not in the wind. Oh, glory to God. But the Lord was not in the wind, and after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the, the earthquake. Can somebody say the Lord was not in the earthquake either? And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. Can someone say the Lord was not in the fire? And after the fire, a still, small voice. Can somebody say a still, small voice? And it was so when Elijah heard it that he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood in the entering in of the cave. And behold, there came a voice unto him and said, What are you doing here, Elijah? So this is the second time the same question is being asked. Amen. And he said, this is Elijah again speaking. I have been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts because the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. And I, even I, only am left, and they seek my life to take it away. Verse 15. And the Lord said unto Elijah, Go, return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. And when you come, anoint Hazael to be king over Syria. And Jehu, the son of Nimshi, shall you anoint to be king over Israel. 
and Elisha the son of Shaphat of Abel Meholah shall you anoint to be prophet in your stead. And it shall come to pass that him who escapes the sword of Hazael shall Jehu kill. And him who escapes from the sword of Jehu shall Elisha kill. Yet I have left me, can somebody say, yet I have left me, 7,000 in Israel, all the knees which have not bowed down to Baal, and every mouth which has not kissed him. Oh, glory to God. Can somebody just shout hallelujah? Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's go into the word. Can somebody say dissect the word? Let me get my water real quick. Dissect the word. So, Father, we again thank you that you are about to speak. We thank you for all the ministers, apostles, evangelists, teachers, prophets, and just laborers in general who will be strengthened by this word of truth. We thank you, mighty God, that you are about to speak in full assurance, in all of your authority, in power, and your people will receive of this meal tonight. In the same way you said to your servant arise and eat i believe that you will be saying these words through the delivery of your word arise and eat thank you all thank you so much let us go into the word so verse 9 of this particular scripture it starts out by giving us a vivid understanding or it gave us a picture of what was happening during that time this Elijah who is now in a wilderness has found himself in a cave it's interesting to note that prior to him going into this cave God, who saw that he was in a state of depression, having gone through separation and isolation, God responded accordingly because God happens to know the need of his people. God saw that Elijah needed strength. See, when you're pouring out into the lives of people on a daily basis, when you're doing ministry, continually there will come a time when you need refreshing can somebody say every minister needs to be refreshed every laborer needs to be refreshed refreshing is extremely important so god looked into his distress and he interpreted it to mean that there's something that my servant elijah needs in order to go forward oh glory to god so god saw that he needed strength not just physical strength but also spiritual strength so he could continue to run through troops and to leap over walls so he could continue to fight with the horsemen and the footmen in Israel during those days can somebody say I understand you woman of God oh glory to God so the word of God said that God sent an angel to attend to Elijah he fell asleep under a juniper or broom tree. And as he slept under the tree, an angel showed up perhaps in the form of flesh, even as they did during the Sodom and Gomorrah incident when they showed up at the house of Lot. So one can only imagine that they probably, or this angel probably showed up in the realm or of the flesh, knocked on him or touched him and said, Elijah, get up. And he pointed to what was already a baked cake. Oh, glory to God. He said, arise and eat. And twice he said that to Elijah. So Elijah was now refreshed physically. But we know that if God sent an angel, oh, glory to God. 
to attend to his servant to give him food. Our God, he knows how to deal with things comprehensively. Come on. He knows how to thoroughly attend to our issues. He knows how to thoroughly address our affairs. So we know that God did not just meet Elijah's immediate physical need, but we know that God would have allowed for him to benefit spiritually from this angelic visitation, which was sanctioned by him, God, or oh, glory to God, even as he was in heaven. Can somebody say, I understand? So here comes Elijah, still in the wilderness. But he has found himself in a cave. Oh, glory to God. You know, it's so mind-boggling that a prophet of the Lord. Oh, glory to God. A prophet of the Lord. One who is very important. One who is of physical and spiritual significance. Could leave out of the comfort of a home where there's probably a couch and a good bed on which to sleep to go to a cave in which are probably some rat bats in which are probably some strange flies in which are probably some deadly snakes in which are probably some very rare animals how could one move or migrate from a place of comfort in the natural realm to go to a place of isolation which was not of oh glory to god an appealing state people of god the spiritual significance of this shift, of this movement, it ought to show us that it is possible. Can someone say it is possible for a child of God, a powerful, rooted, and grounded child of God to go through a state of depression and a state of of feeling alone oh glory to god elijah's psyche was at a point where he was sick and tired we heard what he said before god he said enough god i have had enough and many times even as ministers we're like god we're tired enough god because it doesn't seem as though we are doing anything for you at times we are delivering ungrateful people. We are delivering people who seem to so not be getting their deliverance. Why are we praying for one person 50 million times? God, it looks like nothing is happening in this person's situation. It looks like my prayers are going in vain. It looks like my intercession are vain. So God, enough. I'm tired. And on top of all of that, instead we have a nation that is now repentant before you. That is now penitent before you. Here comes the queen. One who's in authority. One who is the head. One who sits on a throne. One who's full of authority and power. Here comes she telling me that she's after my life. So on top of having to deal with ministerial nuances. Here now. I your prophet. Have to be fleeing for my life. I cannot stay in the town. Because there is a queen who's after my head. I cannot stay in town. Because people in high positions. Representing spiritual wickedness in high places. They've got my name written down on some kind of death contract. I cannot remain in town. I gotta hide and come to this state. Of inhumane living. I'm sick and tired God. I am tired and on top of being tired, nobody seems to understand my pain. Nobody seems to understand why I'm feeling so low within. Nobody seems to understand. I am the one you used to cause the woman, the widow woman, to have food in abundance. Even at a time when she had very little, she swore on her life that she was going to eat and die. But you sent me to deliver her. You fed me via a raven. You did all these things for me. Me, but look at me now, God, I'm at a low place in my life. And we must highlight again the fact that 
all these things are happening at the pinnacle of his ministry. We looked at the fact that the, the, the Mount Carmel, Elijah going up on Mount Carmel, when he called down the fire from heaven, it was representative of him being elevated in ministry. See, he leaves from the ground or the foot of the mountain to go to the very top, the peak. God was showing us that it was not just a physical action. It had a spiritual implication. And the spiritual implication was that Elijah was at the top of his ministry. He was at the climax of his ministry. When we saw the fire come down, that was like another dimension of God's power being manifested in this one called Elijah. And how funny it is that the enemy will wait until we are at the peak of our ministry to shoot us with some kind of attack when we're at the peak of our ministry delivering people from all kinds of sicknesses and disease that's when we get the call that the brother is ill that a child is ill that our mother is in the hospital that's when we get the call that the bank is after us that the police is looking for us oh glory to God that the debt collection agency has gotten our names and in three days they'll come for us that's the time when the enemy seeks to launch the attack when we're in the peak the peak of our ministry the peak of our demonstration of the glory and authority of God in our lives when we're down here it's as though we're, we're of no threat and, and if he tries to attack us down here there won't be the kind of effect public embarrassment and all of that as if we were down here because when we're up here more people know about us and the higher we are and the more we are popular then the greater should be the level of embarrassment and humiliation and so the enemy will go very hard at us when we're at the peak of our ministries can somebody say i understand you shadeen Oh, glory to God. So here comes this man of God in a cave. Can somebody say he's a caveman now? Eh? Temporarily, he's in a cave. But can I tell you, God knows just how to find his people, whether they're in a pit, whether they're in a prison, whether they're in a palace or in a cave. God knows just how to find his true servants because the mark is upon you. The word of God says that he sees us from afar off. The word of God says, according to David, where can I go from your presence, God? Where can I hide from your spirit? If I make my bed in hell, you are there. If I ascend in heaven, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and go to the uttermost part of the sea, Oh dear, you are there also, my God. So we cannot hide from God. David says, Oh God, you know my thoughts from afar off. Behold, there is nothing on my lips, yet you know what I'm about to say. What kind of God are you? What kind of God are you? That you know my thoughts? I'm not speaking words. I'm not making utterances verbally, yet you know what's going on in my mind. Are you telling me, God, that you understand my distress? Are you telling me, God, that you see the offense that is in my heart? You heard when they offended me. You heard when they humiliated me. You heard when they backstabbed me. You heard when they gossiped on my name. You heard all of those things, God. And I don't have anybody to vent to. There's nobody around me in whom I can trust and with whom I can confidentially share these things that I'm going through. But you're saying that, that you're hearing me all this time, God? You're saying that even though I am suffering with all this hurt, that you are seeing the hurt, God? God, I haven't spoken to anyone because I'm afraid they're going to take my business to the same people who are already oppressing me. I'm afraid they're going to take it to the people whom the enemy would love to use to mock me and to scorn me. So I haven't said it to anyone. This thing is like utter shame. It's shameful for a man of God or a woman of God who's seemingly so powerful to come to this point where they're in a lowly state, where they're in a dark place. 
place where they feel like they don't even have the strength to speak into anybody's life, it is a shame. So God, are you saying to me that because I have no one to talk to, I can always turn to you, I can lift up my head and look at the hill from whence cometh my help? Are you saying that you are available for me, God? He is. He is. He says, behold, I am your present help in times of trouble. He said, I never leave you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. So it sounds to me like he's always there. Can somebody say Jehovah Shammah is always there? I can always rely on my Jehovah Shammah. So Elijah, while in the cave, hears the word of the Lord. The word of the Lord came to him. People of God, it is not safe to say that God spoke to him in an audible voice. We don't know because the Lord has different ways of speaking to prophets. He can speak to them in their spirits. He can give them open visions. He can cause them to go into a trance. He can, I don't know, there are just so many ways of speaking to his prophets. We're not sure how the word came, but the word came. Can somebody say the word came? Hallelujah. Now the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the form of a question. Can somebody say that's interesting? The question that God asked Elijah is a question that I hear him asking many persons right now. What are you doing here, Elijah? What are you doing here, Stacy? How did you get to this place of feeling so low? Yesterday you were in my presence shouting hallelujah. Yesterday you were in my presence at the altar interceding for your friends, interceding for a loved one. How did you fall into this state where you don't even have the zeal to pray to me, where you can't even shout Jesus? How did you get to this place? What are you doing at this place? That's what God was asking Elijah. Lisa, what are you doing here? Levi, what are you doing here? Oh, Donna, what are you doing here? Come on, people of God, God is asking, how did you get here? What are you doing here? Because this is not the state to which I have called you. I've called you to experience my kingdom. And my kingdom is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. So how are you now in a state of depression where you have lost your joy, where you have lost your peace, where you have lost your zeal? How did you get here? Say it, the spirit of the living God. What are you doing here? Say it, God. How did you get to this place of not being able to fast for one day for the month? Leaving from a place where you could do 221 days back to back. Oh, glory to God. Or two weeks straight without water. How come you're at this place now where you're finding it extremely difficult to fast for one day? How did you leave from a place of getting up at three in the mornings and giving me at least an hour of worship? To not being able to get up at all. What are you doing here? Say the spirit of the living God. How did you get to this place? Masha Kandai. In the case of Elijah. It was one death threat. From one woman. Telling him he will die in one day. That has caused him to, gotten, to get to that place. The question is in your case. What is it that has caused you to be at the place where you are? Was it one phone call? Was it one text message? Was it one doctor's report? Was it one legal report? What was it that caused you to get to this place of darkness and loneliness? Feeling so low within that the great, great you have been reduced to nothing. How? What are you doing here? What are you doing here, Desreen? 
What are you doing here, Nadisha? What are you doing here, Maureen? My daughter, how did you get here? My daughter, how could you allow flesh and blood to put you to this place or to take you to this place, my daughter? Do you not know that you ought not to be afraid of he who can only kill the flesh, but you ought to fear only he who can kill both flesh and spirit. He can destroy both soul and spirit. It is he that you ought to be fearful of. Flesh and blood has however risen up against you and has risen up in your workplace risen up in the form of authority risen up through people of authority so of course the enemy is not going to cause your little colleague or little equal in your workplace to to be of any kind of threat to you of course not because you know how to avoid these people but when the enemy begins to use people in authority supervisors and managers People who have the authority to write you up. People who have the authority to say you are dismissed. We no longer want you. Then that's a different level of warfare. Can somebody say I agree with you? See, the more you do for God, the more you avail yourself for God, the greater will be the levels of attack. I'm sure in the land of Israel, there were other people who were more deserving of death and instant death. I'm sure there were liars. I'm sure there were thieves. I'm sure there were rapists. But see, the enemy is not threatened by people whom he has already. The people who are a threat to him are those who are destroying and devastating his kingdom. Can somebody say, I understand you? So do you understand now why the war seems so intense on your job? Why everybody else seems to be able to get away with the thing, but the moment you do it, it's like you are in trouble? You've heard other people run jokes before, and their jokes are taken so humorously, but the, the moment you open your big mouth and do the same, you get into trouble for it? Have you ever thought why? Have you ever thought why? Let's look at it in the context of ministry. You're in your ministry. Yeah? And other people are, are able to do certain things. But the moment you try it, there's a problem. The moment you try it, there is a problem. Other people are able to say, Thus saith God. Other people are able to instruct in the name of God. So they say, God said we ought to clean up the altar tomorrow. But you go saying, thus said God. And they refuse you. They reject you. They will not receive of you. Do you think, oh glory to God, it is the flesh that is raging war against you? The word of God according to Ephesians 6 says that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but principalities, powers, rulers of the darkness of this age, spiritual wickedness, not in low places, but they're in high places, they're in high positions, Jezebels, they're in authority, Jezebels, they have a lot of power, Jezebels, they have a lot of influence, Jezebels, they call themselves Christians, but they only have a form of godliness, but they deny the power thereof. Can somebody say, I understand you, Shadim? Again, you can always look back at our teaching on Thursday. Because much of what I just said in the last couple of seconds were a reiteration of what was said on Thursday. Do you understand what I'm saying? I hope already there are some people who are understanding why the warfare is so intense when it comes to you. If you're there not doing anything for God, which means you are not a threat at all to Satan. Satan doesn't need to waste energy on you. 
his cronies and his demons, they have other people to attend to because there are some people who are threatening their lives. There are some people who in the spirit realm are using some uncommon swords and weapons to smite them in the face, to chop off their hands, to break and destroy their weaponry and artillery. So he has no time to attend to you who are doing nothing to his kingdom. So that's the reason why the warfare is so turned up and the heat is so strong on your part because you are doing what God has called you to do when you're walking in your purpose, when you're saying yes to God, when you refuse to compromise, or oh, even as we live in a time and age where men of God and women of God are compromising, the word of God is becoming diluted. The word of God is compromised in many different ways to fit or soothe those who are workers of iniquity. But I'm here to tell somebody that God says he he has seen and he has a charge against you. Mene, mene, take Your days are numbered. Your kingdom is numbered. And you're weighed in the balance. And you're found wanted, saith God. That's for those persons who you out there thinking that your little actions are not being seen. Can you tell them? You make a sad mistake. And even as those who join are inviting other people, tell them, you make a sad mistake to think that God is not seeing your evil works. It's none of us. It's none of us. It's them. Can someone say it's not us? It's them. Hallelujah. So the word of God says that he asked Elijah what he's doing here. How did you get to this place, my servant Elijah? Now here is Elijah's response. Elijah says to God, God, the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant and they've thrown down your altars and they've killed all of your prophets and I am the only one that is left. Oh, glory to God. What is Elijah saying? What is Elijah saying? Elijah is in other words saying something that we have said in our own words today. God, I've walked faithfully before you. God, I've given you my all. There is nothing that you have asked me to do that I have refused to do. You've sent me all the way to Trelawney and I've gone. You've sent me from Trinidad to Guyana and I've gone. You've sent me to some strange people and into some strange environments just for your great name's sake. And I did not hesitate. I went. How did I therefore get to this place of feeling so low? And how come there's not one person, one other prophet in whom I can confide? How come? How come you didn't give me any friends? I feel alone. I feel alone. I don't think that there is anybody else who's in the land of Israel who understands my pain. So that's why I'm here in the cave, God. That's how I got to this place of depression, God. I'm lonely. There's nobody to understand. Just like we are saying to God. I don't think people understand my distress. When I say to somebody that I don't feel myself. When I say to somebody that I am discouraged. Because the breakthrough is not forthcoming. I've been praying for one family for 10 years. And it appears as though nothing is moving. It appears as though nothing is happening. I am your servant. How come the thing is not moving? I am your servant. How come my, man, my marriage that seems to be falling apart. Is looking as though it's not going to come back. To a state of him and to a state of wholeness it's like everything is just being shattered everything is crumbling yet I am your servant I am your warrior I am your intercessor but it doesn't look as though anything is working for me as a matter of fact you know why I got into this cave Lord because you've had me pray for hundreds of people scores of people are in my phone their numbers are there and they call me at various hours of the morning. 
and I get up and sacrifice my time, which I could have otherwise used to sleep, to catch up on beauty sleep, to pray with your people. And you do grant them fear deliverance, but how come you don't seem to be mighty God? You're not answering me. Oh, glory to God. You're delivering them. You're giving them their breakthrough. You're giving them their miracles. But what about me? Am I talking to some ministers, apostles, pastors, prophets, some laborers in the vineyard right now? Am I encouraging some people who have asked God these questions because you've come to this place of loneliness and isolation even in your ministry time before? Am I talking about life into some people who are dead spiritually? Your souls are hurt and you're going through the motions. I really hope that the word of God is resurrecting some things in you. In God, how is it? That you use me to rain down fire. You use me to lay hands on people. Impartation takes place. Healing and deliverance takes place. But when it comes to my personal matters, it's as though you don't hear. It's as though you don't hear. God, what about the fact that I, I want to move out of my one bedroom? What about the fact, God, that I'm tired of walking, God. What about the fact, God, that it could have done me so well to be able to jump into my own vehicle than having to call people who sound like they're annoyed every time I need to go on an assignment. God, what happened to my needs? You're using me to meet the needs of people. But what about my needs? The needs of your servant. Anybody understand? Or am I just talking about myself because there's nobody else who goes through moments such as those anybody i hear somebody saying yes so we have just summarized what elijah was saying to god i've walked faithfully before you i've done all that i could possibly do before you to please you but I think it is unfair that I am lonely. And there goes a death threat. Can someone say there's a death threat? There's an edict of death that hangs over my head. Are you going to allow it, God? I hear many couples, many couples you're asking, God, are you going to allow my marriage to fail? God, I'm your minister. Everybody knows about me. Persons have heard of me. I worship. I'm your choir director. I sing every Sunday morning. If anybody comes to the church, there's a guarantee that they'll see me or hear of me. Because I am very active in your ministry. But the enemy has sent a death threat out to my marriage. My husband is not coming home on time. My husband seems to be spending more time with friends than he's spending with me. My husband is no longer carrying his weight financially. I feel as though I am losing it, God. Are you going to allow the enemy to laugh me to scorn? Are you going to allow my marriage to fail before all of these people, God, who did not even mean me well to begin with? From day one, they desired to kill me. From day one, they desired to eat up my flesh. From day one, they desired for me to fall into their pit. Now are you going to give them a reason to celebrate over me, God? And I am your daughter. I am your servant. I'm still the one who tries to get up to pray to you in the mornings. I'm still the one who lifts up a, a voice and a lamentation on the behalf of my nation. And you're just going to sit by God and do nothing. You're just going to keep silent. So I hope we understand the dialogue 
that was taking place between Elijah and the Lord, his God. So watch this. If there's a conversation, when one person speaks, then you expect that the other person will respond. Amen? It's a conversation. So God started out by asking a question. Elijah, what are you doing here? Shadeen, what are you doing here? And Shadeen says, God, I'm tired. Now, the expectation is that God is going to reply. Amen. Question asked, question answered. Perhaps you're expecting a response. Amen. So when we get to verse 11, we're about to read the response. But see, sometimes, the Lord does not respond the way we want him to. Can you tell two people? That sometimes God does not respond in the way we expect him to. Oh, glory to God. See, we're expecting, and in the case of Elijah, he was expecting that God was going to continue with the conversation. But God is about to answer him unlike the way he anticipates. Can somebody say, God does not speak the same way all the time. And I understand you, Shadeen. Anybody? Here's what was said after Elijah's venting. Because he was venting. See, it's okay to vent to God. Can somebody say, it's okay to vent at times. And he said, this is God now. Go forth. Can someone say, go forth. And stand upon the mount before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by watch this and a great strong wind mm, a strong wind passed by but God was not in the wind and after there was a strong wind there was an earthquake let, let, let us try to understand what's happening here there was a strong wind. I want you to understand this, people of God. That God is not always in what is seemingly strength before us. The things that seem to be strong and the people that seem to be the strongest in our midst when they speak and do things, not all the time is God doing it through them. Oh, glory to God. God is not always found in what appears to be the strongest thing in our midst. He's not always found in what appears to be strength in our midst. Oh, glory to God. We anticipate because of our culture, because of religion and religiosity that certain people just because they have a certain appearance and just because they have a certain reputation that we're going to find God through them all the time and so you're going to avoid going to this little one over here or this teenager down here because there's no way she can be full of God so you've got to go to the one who looks like they're strong in God you got to go to the one who looks like they're full of speaking in tongues they're full of signs and wonders but God is saying to us, I'm not always in that which looks like strength. I'm not always in those who look like they're strong. Because I am the God whose ways are above your ways. My thoughts are not your thoughts. I am the one who used the weak to confound the strong and the foolish to confound the wise. You can't predict God. You can't. You can't. So there was a strong wind, and one would think that God was in it, but God was not. This strong wind, the word of God said it, it broke down even the rocks that were on the mountain, but God was not in it, because God is not always in that which is seemingly strong in the natural realm. Sometimes it is when people showcase this strength or seeming strength on the outside when we see all of that taking place it's just simply pride because god is not in it god is not in it some people use 
their achievements to manipulate people in the name of God. Some people use their position in church and ministry to manipulate people. They speak from their own inspiration, but they come saying, thus saith God, when God never speak. God is saying, listen to me. I'm not always in those conversations and I'm not always in those utterances. So don't be fooled, my son. I'm about to give you a revelation. I allowed you, Elijah, to go through this phase of feeling down and depressed. Because I wanted you, I purposed for you to be separated indeed. Because the separation is about to give you a revelation, a new revelation of who I am. You know me as a drastic God. You know me as a great and terrible God. But I'm about to give you a new revelation as to who I really am. Can someone say, I understand you? So Elijah knows of God in one way. But God is about to let him know that he can manifest in different ways. So God was not in the wind. But watch this. The word of God says that after the wind, there came an earthquake. And everybody knows what earthquake represents in the spirit realm. In the natural realm, earthquake brings a lot of shaking and quaking. But when earthquakes come along, and when we talk about the seven point odd magnitude earthquakes that rock the different Asian countries at times, we've heard of how earthquakes have rocked the Philistines and uh, all those countries. When you hear of earthquake, it usually brings devastation, but not just devastation, but confusion, chaos. Oh, glory to God. Tumult. God is saying to Elijah, Elijah, I'm not in the noise, Elijah. Elijah, I'm not going to always be in what looks like power or authority because some people think that authority is shouting and authority is having the loudest voice, but authority, oh, glory to God, has nothing to do with speaking loudly. When you have authority, you can whisper and the enemy has just got to bow. Authority is not shouting. Can you tell two people, authority is not shouting. So God is saying, when you hear all these people shouting in my name at times, and when you hear and see what looks like um, fire and Pentecostal fire, I'm not in it at times, saith the spirit of the living God. Men think that there has to be what looks like this huge thing. People getting in spirit, throwing themselves on the ground and all those things. I'm not always in those things, say the spirit of the living God. Much of those things before me are confusion. Much of those things bring about a spiritual chaos. And I'm not in that. So God was neither in the wind nor in the earthquake. So watch this. This one now is interesting. After the wind and the earthquake, God passed by in a fire. Can somebody say fire? When we hear of fire, and especially even as we look at the old dispensation, fire usually represents judgment. Can someone say fire is judgment? And judgment even to the extent where we can use the very life and ministry of Elijah to attest to that comparison of fire with judgment. Because when he called down fire on Mount Carmel, there was judgment. Am I talking lie or truth? There was judgment. The worshippers of Baal were judged on Carmel. So when we talk about fire, 
We're talking about the judgment of God. Of course, fire has other meanings too. Fire speaks of light. It speaks of heat. And the list goes on and on. It purifies, it purges. But in this dispensation, when you look at the fact that just a few days ago, Elijah had an experience where God manifested in fire. Here comes God showing him back the fire, but this time he was not in it. What is God saying? I am a great and terrible God. But I am still, can someone say I am still a merciful God? There is a time for judgment, but there is a time to show mercy. So the Lord was saying to Elijah, Elijah, I'm not always the God who judges. I, I don't always judge. Sometimes I, I extend mercy to my people, Elijah. Elijah, I'm not just a judgmental God. Throughout your life and ministry, you have seen me in that light. I usually respond to you in dramatic ways, my servant. I use a lot of illustration and dramatization in my manifestation to you, Elijah. But here I am, having separated you unto myself, even in the wilderness, even in this place where there is nothing but a cave. I am giving you a new revelation of who I am. See, sometimes when we as ministers and servants of God, when we find ourselves in certain positions, position of feeling distressed, lonely and isolated, where we feel as though there is no fire in us, where we feel as though there is no zeal in us, sometimes what we need to get a kickstart Heart. What we need to go forward is just a new revelation from God. Can somebody say, my friend, perhaps God wants to give you a new revelation of who he is. Hence the reason you're going through what you're going through. Away with old revelation. Can somebody say away with old revelation? I don't know about you, but for me, I'm sick and tired of having to sit in congregations and the moment I hear that the preacher is gonna speak on a, a certain text of the Bible, it's like I can predict what he's gonna say. Anybody knows what I mean? It's the same old, same old, same old revelation because you're not in the presence, so you're not getting anything new. You are a seasoned pastor. You are a seasoned minister. You're not in the presence when you stand before the Lord's people. When you stand on the pulpit, you go back in time to messages you preached from 2002. But God is saying it is a new dispensation now. The people need a Rima word now. The people want to hear from me now. So come before me. Let me give you the new wine, saith God. So what is being poured out into some people now is stale old wine. Can somebody say the wine that some persons are getting is very stale. There's no new revelation. There's no new revelation. Oh, glory to God. Every time you see the people, you can't always be telling the people that God is going to judge them. You can't always tell them that because God says, behold, I am merciful. I forgive sins. I forgive transgressions and iniquity. I by no means clear the guilty, but I visit the iniquity of the children, or of the fathers, even on the children, even to the third and fourth generation. So he's not always judging but because we we don't have a different revelation of who he is we continue to drive fear into people without even realizing because if every time you have a word from the lord it is judgment 
or every time you're delivering a sermon, it is judgment. You're going to cause fear and not the godly kind of fear, the fear that would make them want to turn and repent. But the fear that would make them be afraid of your God to the extent where they want nothing to do with him. We have to have different revelations of God. Because there are different sides to him. Anybody agrees? He's not always in the judgment mood. He does judge for real. And he's the righteous judge. But I'm saying... There are times when he's extremely merciful. Can someone say our God is judgmental, but he's also merciful? Can the church say amen? So he was not in the wind. He was not in the earthquake. He was not in the fire. Where is he? Anybody reading ahead? The word of God says, there was a still, can someone say a still, small voice. There was a stillness. And much to Elijah's surprise, he found God in the silence. This is very deep. You did not hear God when everybody was giving you their opinion. You call Sister Pat, you call Sister Theresa, and everybody has an input in your life and marriage. One person is telling you do a divorce, another person is saying separate and move back to your mother. One person is saying, woman of God, God is giving you your own ministry, another person is saying stay where you are. A lot of noise, a lot of confusion. And because there are so many voices that are speaking as represented by the wind, the earthquake, and the fire, sometimes you will not hear God because of all the voices that are speaking. Sometimes you will only hear God when you separate from the noise, when you separate from the tumult, and when you are at that place of utter silence, then out of the silence will be the voice of God. Sometimes the silence speaks louder than when you're hearing people's voices in your ears saying God says when God never spoke. All they're telling you are things based on their own own opinion and their own inspiration God never spoke to them God did not instruct them but you now are finding God in your moment of silence it is amazing how God can speak in silent moments see you don't you know you, you no longer have certain people talking to you nobody is confusing you you are no longer wavering between two opinions it is in those moments when everybody leaves when some of you will begin to hear god you're asking God, should I proceed with this transaction? God, should I proceed with this paperwork? And everybody has something to say. All of a sudden, everybody is hearing from God and God says. And 10 people have spoken to you, but you still don't know what decision to make because there's confusion. Sometimes when you take the drastic step of shutting them out, even if it means coming off WhatsApp for a while, even if it means just being away from the noise for a while. Sometimes it is when you take those drastic steps that you will begin to hear the voice of God. I don't know who I am talking to, but there are some persons who needed to hear this part of the message. I'm sure that some of the persons with whom you have consulted for answers, for input, 
They are reputable people. And they are men and women of God. Authentic men and women of God. But perhaps God doesn't want to talk to you through anybody this time around. Perhaps he is not willing to speak to you through a spokesperson this time around. You're used to him sending a prophet to you or giving you a prophetic word. But maybe God says this season, I want to change up the way I speak to you. Maybe I'm going to speak to you in my word this season. This season, I want to speak to you in song. This season, I want to speak to you through something else. I am a very rounded God I don't do it the same way all the time so God wants to give some of you a new revelation of him and that's the reason why oh glory to God some of you are at the place where you're at you thought it was all about the marriage you thought it was all about the business that is going down you thought it was all about you. And God is saying, I allowed you to get to this place because I want to give you a new revelation of me. The separation was for a revelation. And since you are discouraged, not only am I going to give you a revelation, but I'm about to give you instruction. Can someone say separation for revelation, for instruction? The word of God says that God, he said to Elijah, okay, Elijah, my servant, I want you to go back to your town and I want you to anoint as king so-and-so, so-and-so. He's giving him work to do. Can someone say God is now giving Elijah new assignments? How did we get here again? From a death threat to feeling depressed to being given angelic food or food from the Lord, strength from the Lord to getting a revelation of the Lord a divine encounter, which is what some of you need to give you strength to go back in the vineyard, to go back at work, to now being given the, um, instructions. So as far as I can see, it sounds like revival is taking place in this man's life and ministry. It sounds like refreshing is taking place in this man's life and ministry. He cried out and God heard. God just knows what his people need to keep them going again. He knew just what Elijah, his servant, needed to get him zealous again. God separated him, then gave him a supernatural encounter because he knew perhaps that these are the things that infused Elijah. These are the things that caused his spirit to be stirred up. So God knows just what stirs up your spirit. Desreen, God knows just how to rile you up for him. Donna, God knows just how to get you all happy and zealous for him. So God caused a supernatural encounter to occur in the life of Elijah in this moment and not only did he give him a divine experience but he now gives him instructions to carry out big assignments can someone say big assignment the enemy thought it was over 
Because sure enough, this one called Jezebel, she was very much convinced that Elijah would have gone under. That he would have been removed from the face of the earth. What she did not know was that what she and the people of Israel had rejected, God had accepted. The man who was very little and insignificant in their eyes was very big and powerful in the sight of God. Away with you, Jezebel! You can say what you want to say. You can threaten as much as you want. But we serve a big, big God. He's our deliverer. He's our fortress. He's our shield and our exceedingly great reward. Can I just find five persons who refuse to be intimidated by the authority that is being exercised by the Jezebels in our lives? We refuse to be intimidated by Jezebel in my workplace. We refuse to be intimidated by Jezebel in my church. We refuse to be intimidated by Jezebels in my family and by Jezebels in my country. We refuse. Jezebels are out there blowing threat. But when she blows threat to destroy, that's when one has got to get to that quiet place and search for God even in the still small voice. Because when he speaks, the word itself has the power to revive and to resurrect a dampened spirit that is within us. Oh, glory to God. The Lord has a way of turning the thing that the enemy meant for evil into good. Let us use this particular example as a teaching point for our own lives. The more the enemy attacks, the more he seeks to kill, steal, and destroy, is the more we're going to draw into the presence of God. Because we know that when we get in his presence, there is fullness of joy, and that at his right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. We know that when we get into his presence, he can give us a fresh encounter. He can give us a fresh revelation. And perhaps that's all. That's all we need. Perhaps that's all Janet needs. Perhaps that's all Donna needs. Perhaps that's all Desiree needs. An encounter with God. The encounter does not have to be as dramatic as the one experienced by Elijah. It doesn't have to be. But just an encounter is enough for me. Can somebody say, I want an encounter. Randall Soto. Can you imagine that in his lowest moment, God gave him instruction to carry on the work. This man was feeling so low, insignificant. He felt as though there were some ungrateful people, unthankful people around him. He probably felt as though his labor was in vain. And in the midst of feeling that way, here comes God giving him a big assignment. Am I talking to anybody? Where people have made you feel insignificant. They have overlooked you, oh glory to God. They have disregarded you because you're not qualified as far as they are concerned. But just when you're in that place, 
of starting to accept their perception of you, which for the most part is a lie from the pit of hell. Here comes your God giving you big assignments that other men and women in the land have not been given. Oh, can somebody just begin to worship their big God who knows how to show favor to those who truly believe and trust in him. What a God. What a mighty God we serve. You think God has forgotten about your deeds and your faithfulness? You think he has some kind of short memory issue where he easily forgets? That's not the kind of God that we serve. He remembers, he remembers, he remembers. In fact, Psalm chapter 9 says that the Lord remembers the cry of the humble. He knows everything concerning you. He never forgets you. He remembers your deeds. He sees and he hears what people do and say about you. Even when you don't hear what they have to say. Even when they say these things in their hearts. Oh, she sounds like a madman. Oh, she sounds so. Uh, and all kinds of things people say in their hearts. Evil as things. But God says, I see it all. I hear it all. Oh, glory to God. You don't have to utter the words. But I, God, I read what is written on the tablets of people's hearts. Don't think, my daughter, that I didn't see what they had to say about you. Don't think, my daughter, that when they're in their rooms, when they're in their bed chambers, in their closets, when they think they're isolated and away from everybody else, that I don't hear their conversations. My daughter, I hear their criticisms. I hear their judgments. I hear all the things they have to say. But I know how to prepare a table for you, my child, in the very presence of your enemies. Oh, glory to God. So when God says to Elijah, I want you to go anoint all these people. God was preparing a table for him. Jezebel or no Jezebel. Touch not the Lord's anointed and do his prophet no harm, you Jezebel. Can somebody just tell the spirit of Jezebel? Touch not the Lord's anointed. Do think twice, oh glory to God. Do his servant no harm. Do his prophet no harm. Oh, glory to God. She thought it was going to be over. But no man can say it's over unless God says it is over. So they say your marriage is over. Unless God says it's over, it's not over. They say because you have stage four or stage three cancer, it is over. Unless God said it's over, it's not over. They said this sickness, leukemia, and this bleeding issue that you have is not going to cause you to be able to produce eggs or to have children. And so it's over. Unless God has said it is over, it is not over. I want you to tell five persons on this broadcast. Unless God says it's over, it's not over. No, five people need to hear. Unless God says it is over, it is not over. Because these five people have been listening to voices in the noise. They've been hearing some stuff in the form of earthquakes and fire and all these kinds of things, winds. But God says, in my still small voice, I'm about to let you know that unless I said to you it is over, it is not over. Whose report? Do you believe? Isaiah asked in Isaiah 53. Who will believe our report? Isaiah 53 1. 
Whose report do you believe? And do you believe the report of Isaiah 53? Lift up your hands. Lift up your hands, every single person. Hallelujah. Yes, it's not over, Maureen. It's not over, Donna. It's not over. Yes, thank you, Janet. It's not over. April, it's not over. Millicent, it's not over. It's not over. Rama Shakandai. Andrea, Ricky, Tedeboshia. It's not over, Katie. Colleen, it's not over. Maketoreba. Leku Samatu Rianda. God wants his people to end this season. Be careful of the voices. The voices to which we listen. Be careful of all those who will come saying they're giving us advice. And anytime you feel as though you are becoming confused, know that God is not in it. Because he's not the author of confusion. That's when you need to separate, when it becomes confusing. You're at a crossroad and you need to decide. But this person is telling you go that way. Another person is saying go that way. One is saying going forward. One is saying remain still. It's too much confusion. And God says I'm not in the confusion. So here's what I want you to do. Separate ye yourself from the tumult. Come and find me in a cave. Even if you have to go to that extreme. And just be still. Be still, be still, because perhaps you will find me in that stillness. Perhaps my silence will speak even louder than words. God is not the author of the confusion. I don't know who I'm talking to, but I believe very strongly that I'm speaking to some persons, at least three people, who are in a season where you must make a very critical decision. But you have been wavering between opinions. You're not sure what choice to make. And because you're not sure, the thing is almost weighing down on you. You're carrying this burden because you need closure. But you're not getting anywhere because all you're hearing is confusion. Maybe the Lord has sent me to say to you, begin to withdraw yourself into a place where it's just you and your God, you and God alone. Say the matter to him. Because perhaps in all of your venting and talking and asking, you're yet to consult with God. So God says, separate from everybody else, withdraw from everybody else and come before me and seek my face and you will find me, saith God, when you seek for me with all of your heart. Am I talking to some people who are already making up in their minds that you're not gonna seek God partially one side of you is not going to be seeking him and another side of you is going to be desperate for somebody else's opinion. But you're going in his presence, seeking him wholeheartedly. God says in Jeremiah 29, 13, and you shall find me when you seek for me with all of your heart. Not with some of your heart, but with all of your heart. Can somebody say all of your heart? Can somebody say, all of my heart is required before God? So if you are that person who needs to make a very critical decision, at least for one of you, the decision is time sensitive. There is a timeline on it, I'm hearing. 
I don't know if that timeline is at the end of the month. I don't know. But you must make a decision. If you continue to look for an answer in your earthquakes, in your winds, and in your fire, you might just make a mistake that will cost you and cost you dearly. It might just cost you financially. It might just cost you spiritually. But even more importantly, it might cost you emotionally. And that can cause you to go out of your mind. I've heard of stories where pastors have committed suicide. I'm here to encourage somebody. If you are that person who needs to make that very critical decision, but you're being confronted by nothing but confusion, I'm here to tell you it is okay to isolate to God, unto God. It is okay. As long as you are separating unto God, that's fine. Separating in an atmosphere of prayer, fasting, and worship. Some of us, we eat too much. What, what is wrong with forsaking one day's meal to go before your God for clarity? What's wrong with that? What's wrong with not eating from 6 to 6 p.m.? What, what's wrong with that? So for some persons, the difference between you and you getting your breakthrough is probably that hour of prayer and fasting. It's probably that day of no eating and just seeking the face of God. Anybody understands? Am I talking truth or am I lying to you? Anybody? I am? Lift up your hands. All the persons who are looking for God in all the wrong places. This time you have determined in your heart that you need to hear from God. Even through the still, small voice. Lift up your hands. Lift up your hands. And so, Father, we bow our hearts before you. I place before you every individual who's under the sound of my voice, who is going through a season where important decisions must be made. I lift up those persons, Lord. They're looking for clarity. They're looking for guidance. They're looking for instructions. Father, I ask that you will divinely intervene and cause all other voices in their lives to be silenced. Let the voices of demons and devils become silenced. Let the voices of persons who are speaking out of their flesh and they are speaking out of their own inspiration, let them lose the effectiveness of their opinions and suggestions. Let the people to whom they're making suggestions no longer consider what they have to say as valuable in this season and for this particular purpose. For in this particular season, you want to speak through the stillness 
and silence of your voice. So I pray you would give them the strength, the strength to say no, the strength to say not now, the strength, oh God, to prostrate before you, to cry out before you, grant it unto them, grant it unto them. Cause your people to value you and what you have to say more than what anybody else has to say in this season. And because they're going to now value you more than the voice and opinions of flesh and blood, they'll fervently pray to you. They'll desperately chase after you. And because they will not let up, you will answer. You will answer. And when you give them that answer, and when you give them that instruction, they shall execute in boldness. For they know that they know that they know you have spoken. So I pray that any person under the sound of my voice who is going through such situation that you will begin to mark them, mm -hmm. mark them, mark them for separation, separation unto you, separation into a time of prayer, separation into a time of fasting and worship. revelation let them be marked for revelation too and then grant them new instructions give them new assignments there are some people who will be given new assignments yeah God is getting ready to give some of you instructions but the instructions unlike in the past will not be given to you through other people maybe you're used to the man of God coming to you the prophetess or the prophet saying God says to do so and so God wants to give you some instructions himself by his spirit but the only way to hear these instructions is if you allow yourself to hear the silence of his voice. If you shut out and shut down the noise happening all around you. Enough of the noise. God wants to speak to you himself. Anybody agrees? Anybody agrees? God wants to talk to you by his spirit. He wants to reveal himself to you in a different way. In a way you have never experienced him before. So all this thing you're going through, feeling distressed, feeling weighed down, feeling burdened, feeling alone, feeling like nobody understands. God has a purpose behind allowing you to feel this way. I believe he's setting some of you up for a divine encounter, even as he did in the case of Elijah. Can someone say divine encounter? I welcome it, Lord. I welcome a divine encounter with you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Is there anybody watching this program for the first time who has not given their heart to the Lord? <clears throat> Anyone? Anybody who wishes to say yes to 
God through Jesus Christ, his son. Jesus Christ loves you. He wants to restore you. He wants to revive you. He wants to speak to you. He wants to reveal and manifest himself to you. Will you just allow him to come in? Because he says, behold, he stands at your door, the door of your heart. And he's knocking. And while there are some other powers and spirits and persons who will run out of patience and they'll break in, they'll kick down the door, Jesus will not do that. He's very gentle. He is a gentleman. And he's knocking. And knocking patiently too. He said, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If you hear me and let me in, I'll come and dine with you. Is there anyone who wants to dine with Jesus? Because you know that he'll give you the kind of new wine that will last a lifetime. You know that the feast you'll get at his table, it will not go dry and it will not run out of your body. It will remain. Anybody wants to dine with Jesus? Say this prayer after me, Lord. I confess of my sins. Purge me with your blood. Wash me. Cleanse me comprehensively and thoroughly. Remove all uncleanness from my spirit. Remove all impurities from my soul. Father, enter my life. And take control of my mind and my heart. I want you to be the manager of this body. Even as I decree and declare right now. That as of this moment, this body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Take full control of my life. Help me to know the reason I was created. Help me to find my true identity in Christ. Help me, Lord, to experience your perfect love, peace, and joy. Father, your word says that if I confess with my lips and believe in my heart, then I shall be saved. So because I have confessed, and because I do believe, I now profess that I am a child of the living God. I'm no longer a slave to sin, but I'm now a son. I am now a hear of the almighty God. A hear of God through Christ. I have been saved, not by my works, not by my eloquence, not by my good deeds, but I am saved by grace. The law came through Moses, people of God, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Sashi bless, welcome, George, welcome to this program. Um, where are you watching from, George? Can the people who are watching outside of Jamaica just quickly type your country? Are you in the Caribbean? Let me know. Are you in the States? Let me know. I want to know where you're watching the broadcast from. And I really hope that today's word has encouraged and strengthened the people of God. Some of you are suddenly desiring to be in God's presence because the matter is very pressing and the sooner you go before God the sooner you'll get the answer and clarity that you're looking for I want to thank every single person Janet Wow USA 
Alicia representing West Milland. Can we put our hands together for Alicia? We are so grateful to God that he has spoken. And I know the word he brought today was not brought or delivered in vain. I hear chains breaking. Because some people needed to get this liberation in their minds. So mental freedom is occurring right now. Emotional freedom is occurring right now. People who have been struggling to sleep at nights because the matter has been on their mind so strongly. I hear in the spirit that some of you are going to sleep like a baby tonight. Let it be done, Father. Let it be done according to your will. Let it be done out of your love. Hallelujah. Thank you so much, everyone, for watching this broadcast. It's always a pleasure to minister the word of God. It's not done by might nor by power but only by his spirit and for that i'm so grateful i'm really grateful lord we are grateful i dare not come before you representing myself i dare not come before you to make it seem as though i have it all together i am unlearned I am untaught. This is the Lord's doing. So we must give all credit to him. Wherever you are, let us just put our hands together for God through Christ and through the Holy Spirit. Yes, we love him. Don't we? We love him so much. So we've come to the end of today's broadcast. In case you missed the beginning, this broadcast is actually being streamed from Kingston, Jamaica. My name is Shadeen Anglin, and I look forward to speaking with you tomorrow evening at 7.30 on this page, just the same. Please feel free to check out the YouTube link above. You can always subscribe, and um, you can always write me a message, a personal message direct message and I will I will respond to you by going on the message option on the page I end by saying I love you but guess what the Lord loves you so much more do you believe that Jennifer Nash Valerie Desreen do you believe that Anne Marie Mary Stacy God loves you so much more than I do so we will see each other again. Have a great night. Enjoy your rest. Have a great morning for those who are experiencing morning already. I love you all. See you very soon. Remember to keep me in your prayers. I do crave your love, your support, your prayers. Support through prayers. I appreciate so much. Thank you. God bless you.